Rebecca Mebian. I'm um, really grateful to have you here on the Entheogenica podcast today. And you're in Costa Rica right now. I'm in Ireland, so we're crossing, we're crossing boundaries and space and time to have a conversation that I know is going to mean a lot to both of us. I think to have a have a space to go where we are or where we're about to go today. Um, I just want to mention that Ebian and I actually recorded, we sat down to record a podcast a couple of months ago and with all of the changes, I think it was September we recorded, and with all of the changes that have happened globally since October, you know, I checked in with Ebian and I was like, should we release that or should we, should we come back to the conversation? Because I think the world feels like an entirely different playing field now. Um, it's now February and we are months, I think, into to a major, major global witnessing, for want of a better word. So welcome and thank you and let's see where this goes. I'm going to open thank up, you, yeah, I'm, I'm going to open up by, by just inviting you to position with me how important it is for us to be able to show up and have radically honest conversations about how we're feeling and bring it to the public domain and what that might look like for you in this moment in time with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that part of the, the honesty required in this moment is also a resensitization to the suffering in the world. And there's a sense of changing our ideas, the illusion of what the self means. So because of the orientation of modern society and philosophy, let's say, born from um, mostly Eurocentric values, patriarchal values as well, there's an individuated focus and consciousness that has propelled and um, oriented the majority of humanity towards, for example, like my success, my path, and my abundance. So there's a lot of I and my in that. And what I feel is being called from us in this moment is the embodiment of what a lot of spiritual traditions have passed forward, which is the knowledge of perhaps the more invisible but truthful version of the self, which is the ecosystem of self, that there is a form of individuated consciousness, but just like you know, the fingers of a hand, the entire ecosystem is still a hand. And we are branches of that. And so how that relates in this moment, for example, as I attune, and, and I know that obviously, you know, you have and many people in the world with this central locus of focus, which is, you know, Gaza and Palestine, and what is being done there, it's not that it's happening to them but it's happening to an extension of the self. And so, and in that same way, we can look at what is, you know, in this case, the oppressor or the, the perpetrator of violence and um, disproportionate violence, I would say, not to discredit violence that has happened in October 7th, but we can also discuss perhaps, you know, further on that, that we have to hold the contextual understanding of where the, um, the resistance went on October 7th, how the resistance manifested on October 7th is a result of a, of a much longer violence and a disproportionate power dynamic that has, has been happening on that land. But so it's not that the suffering is of them, 
it's a suffering of the extension of myself. And in the same way, looking at the perpetrator or the oppressor and feeling into that is an extension of myself. And when I do that, I have further clarity on what is needed at this time. What is the most urgent need? So for example, the most urgent need may not be to necessarily placate or focus on the healing of the ancestral trauma that has led to some of the delusion causing people to say, yes, kill 12,000 children, whatever is needed for us to be safe. That there's an orientation when holding an equal proportion, the extension of the self towards these, these factions of, of consciousness, that the deep suffering of the most marginalized people requires the utmost priority in my life. And so everything that has, you know, come since October 7th, even though this, you know, this has been happening for a long time. It's not only here, right? It's, hap it's happened and it's happening, it's happening in Congo and Sudan and Syria. And many of the list goes on. It has happened 20 years ago. It has happened 30, 40. So what the, the beauty of what is happening, if I can dare to use that word, is that it is so palpable and in our, in our face, literally that we have a chance to resensitize and to redefine the sense of self. And when that happens in one place, in one moment with enough people, it creates a ripple effect and an echo out for the rest of the liberation movements throughout the world. And we see a rise in fascism through the governments in Europe and the US. So it is not in any way separate from us. It's just different layers of proportionality. Yeah, this is beautiful, and and thank you for having such eloquence in in being able to transmit to transmit and and um, highlight the nuances of of what we are witnessing and and this piece around you know this this echo that we can make as a collective as more of us move into really witnessing and feeling and also recognizing this piece that when we're right now what we're witnessing with Palestine and with Gaza like you say it is a it is almost an echo chamber for 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 all of the atrocities for all of the um the harm the genocide the famine the, all of these pieces that have been happening and continue to happen in many parts of the world. But it's this piece of the, the lens through which this particular atrocity is being broadcast to the world for in, in, this, in this deep, deep cry, I believe, from the collective spirit that's saying, please look, please feel, please, please wake up in many ways. And... You know, one of the things I wanted to bring to this to this conversation between us is around that part of so many people, many people in my own world, many, many friends who who I who I love, many people whose work I have deeply respected, have chosen for various reasons that they will argue not to not to get involved. I mean, potentially some people are getting are, are taking action that is not maybe in the public domain. And, you know, I have teachers who are not on social media, who have never been on social media, who are not maybe campaigning in that way, but they are doing things at more grassroots level and behind the scenes. So that it's not that that can't happen. But. I have friends, and I'm sure you do, and colleagues who have upwards of 50, 60, 70, 80, 90,000, 100,000 followers who have been completely silent on the issue. And I, I have been having to work through a process of checking, you know, where are my own judgments arising um, in my projection of what should, what should be done, what is the right thing to do. But I bring this to the space between us now to sort of ask the question from your perspective when we are choosing not to engage and we are positioning ourselves as healers or guides or spiritual teachers and we are choosing not to shed any light on what is happening. Can you can you tell me what arises in you when we bring this to the space? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. And it's a very important aspect in all of this. So the first thing that I will say is one of the key proponents throughout, uh, let's say, like neo-spirituality and drawing from inspiration, mostly from Eastern philosophy, but also from like Christianity and Christ consciousness is around compassion. So compassion being a pillar that is supposedly shared throughout New Age spirituality. And yet that compassion is selective. It's selective to when it's self-serving oftentimes or when it is in link some, you know, indirectly, but close enough so that I feel tied to this. And the issue with that is that it's not really compassion because what our silence does is enable and perpetuate systems of violence. Systems that the whole reason any of us turn towards spirituality is because our soul is aching for something deeper, something more. And so we have a chance to be about that something more now. But what I think, and I, and I don't remember who from, from who I'm, I heard this, but I, I felt it to be a, a very, like, like a, a bright light of knowledge towards what is happening in, um, let's say, influencer culture, also spiritual and healer teachers that are staying silent. So they said, everyone has been talking about the Great Awakening. What they didn't think about the Great Awakening is that it would not be about them. That it would not be about the hundreds of ayahuasca ceremonies or mushroom ceremonies or revelations or about creating the most magical, beautiful song. That it would be about the blood spilt unjustly across the world, but that is part of, of a liberation movement that is intending to keep alive the soul of humanity, that is trying to water the soul of humanity. Because obviously what we've been doing is not working. Our entire species is going towards ecocide. Like that's just the reality. And I don't need to spout out any of the doom and gloom statistics. I'm pretty sure everyone is aware of it. But it is helpful to feel into that doom and gloom because in order for things to change, we need radical change. And that requires a radicality to be born from us. And what I mean by radical comes from uh, Asata Shakur who said, and, and you know, clarified, radical means grasping things at their root. So what our, our, our comfort and privilege bubbles has done through influencer culture, through um, through, let's say, like spiritual fame, is that we get to have one toe in the system, we get to have the luxury, we get to have the privilege, but then we also get to be bringing in healing and wellness and well-being into a world that is hungry and starving for it. But that is still colluding with a system, and that system includes colonialism. That system is, is standing on the backs and the feet of the minerals, the resources, and the people of the global South, you know, and of the indigenous first, first nations. And so the, there's, there's appropriation of those cultures to, to bring in wellness and well-being, but there isn't a dedication to the liberation movement of those cultures, you know. And in the same, in the same vein, you know, like white supremacy is embedded in our, in our global structure and system. And, and beyond that, it's embedded in the subtle workings of the mind over generations. And so unless there's deep-seated willingness to lean into not just saying I'm not a, a racist, but anti-racism work within spirituality, then nothing is going to change. We are going to continue to build individual bubbles of success on top of the exploitation of the body, the land, and the, the hearts and minds of indigenous people throughout the world. And so that aspect of it leads me to silence is violence, particularly because the reason any one of us can be silent is we're sitting from a place of privilege. If this was happening to us, we would be begging the world to have humanity and to show up for us. And so the only way to attune to that is to be porous enough to allow the pain and the suffering of the images that we're seeing to penetrate 
than to allow ourselves to be those people under the rubble, the mother who is, who is, you know, in hysteria because she, she cannot understand how her entire family has been obliterated. And anyone who has given birth should know the sanctity of each and every life because the magnitude of birth teaches that, you know, and particularly if you've given natural birth, but nonetheless, nonetheless, even if cesarean, you had to cut through seven layers, it's a miracle any of us are here, seven layers of the abdomen had to be cut for us to exist. <laughs> so there's, there's a layer of privilege that in its definition means like it's in our blind spot. You know, you, you don't know that you have privilege unless you lean into deconstructing that which prevents us from seeing that. And so to talk about like, what are some of those things? And, and I love the prayer, for example, from the Vedas, Asatoma Satgamaya, and we can hear this a lot in medicine and ceremonies. It's sung a lot, but how much do we actually listen to the word? So the, that, that mantra, the first line says, lead me from ignorance to knowledge. So ignorance is part of what is pervading our world. And it has very little to do, there was a, a funny meme that said like, remember when we thought people were stupid because they didn't have an access to, to information? Well, now we have the internet and guess what? It's not that. <laughs> so to break through ignorance and to lean in towards knowledge requires researching and listening. And listening also includes paying attention to the voices that I don't agree with or that are not common to the people around me. So during my own forming of, let's say, an opinion in this topic, as and I, and I speak the word intellectual, but I want to I want to uh, just clarify that doesn't mean only living in the mind. It means the mind in harmony and in service with the other intelligences in the body, with the heart intelligence, with the womb and gut intelligence. And with the collective field of, of intelligence that informs all of that. And so in order for me to form an opinion, I have to first research as well as I can what is not like um, um, outside of the, of the binary of partisan opin you know, opinion and, and framing, what is the information that is out there as close, to, as close to factual as I can. And that's debatable because we live in biased colonial empires, but you can't find it, you know. Second, listen to those who I don't agree with. Pay attention. It also will help inform solutions in the future to do that. And then from that place, after listening, after researching, after reading, to be able to form an opinion. Does that mean we need a PhD to be able to feel in our heart that this is wrong? No, but it means to break through ignorance, there has to be a willingness to inform oneself about that which is in my blind spot. That which my privilege does not make, it doesn't put a fire in my butt to care about. And though obviously I'm a, I'm a brown African indigenous woman, half, you know, I'm biracial, I'm half Somali, half Italian, but I live in a privilege bubble that could also gift me the ability to just coax on by and to forget about this. But I have a sense that in humanity, specifically at this time, if any of us get quiet enough, there is a rumbling, bubbling volcano that is trying to birth itself through us. And that volcano is a new world with a new kind of humanity. And so sometimes mindfulness and self-love and self-care practices are actually just kind of like trying to like get that volcano to go. <laughs> True self-love is connected to the well-being of all of our brethren and, and sisters in the world and relatives, you know, regardless of blood, regardless of faith, regardless of culture. And so that volcano then becomes, is here to inform. And that's why it's, I, I, I call that, that volcano the soulful rebellion. That's the rebellion to the mania of modern society. And yeah, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I think this is a, a a big part of the the journey is the 
it's the recognition of the the amount of wisdom that lies there in the discomfort it's like in in allowing yourself to be in grief to be in sorrow to be in rage and and this is this piece of deep of of deep embodiment because the layers for me personally the layers of disembodiment that need to occur in order for us to be able to say I'm going to turn that off and I'm going to focus on keeping this momentum of positivity of you know raising whatever it is that that raising the vibration or keeping the vibration vibration at a certain level but it's this piece of and my, my own journey over these last weeks has been in how do I marry not becoming completely shut down because of what I'm what I'm witnessing and what I'm feeling in my body and trying to process the holding of that and process being a woman with privilege and having a beautiful life and having work to do and keeping all of these pieces afloat and finding finding a way to marry it but recognizing that it's in this piece of really deep feeling that is where the embodiment lies and how can we yeah remind each other that it's that this is where the medicine's at yes yeah so important and i really appreciate that you brought up that part of of our being that wants to protect by disassociating. And so a common um, trope, let's say, particularly what, what I've noticed in others in the field of, of white feminism is that it's, you know, I'm willing to show up when it's directly related to my liberation cause. So women's rights issues and only women's rights issues, not aware of the intersectionality but then also I have to protect myself because we're not meant to be seeing all of the horrors in the world all of the time. So that's literally like taking the broom and sweeping dust under the carpet so that I don't have to deal with it because it's over there and that part of the house doesn't really matter to me. But if it's like on my countertop and it's where I'm working, then I need to like organize it. But again, if we're actually going into the more expanded awareness of we are all extensions of the same ecosystem and whatever is happening over there has an effect maybe not in me tomorrow but it may have an effect in me in in some years in my society or in my children's society because at the end of the day it is the world that they are being born in and we are stepping towards become and the, the orientation is to live our life so that we are ancestors we would be proud of descending from. And so I can't imagine dying in a few years and, and thinking, you know, oh, I did such a good job protecting myself from the harm in the world. Right? Like who, none of us, really. It's really, it's absurd. And I think this is why it's, the issue is desensitization. If we had a moment to just exist and breathe, I don't think there's anyone in the world. There's just layers of armor and desensitization that prevent us from actually being able to have the conversation from here and from here. You can't see my hand, but it's on my, my gut, you know? And so from that sense, there, there is the reality of, I mean, I, I and many of, of the people who, who you know, I'm in community with, like, especially in the beginning, like the first two months, I do think that in some way we've become almost more calloused around it, but not in the sense where it stops us from looking now, but we're just, we've got, we're, 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 we're with it fully so much for so long that we can hold more of it. But particularly in the beginning, I remember having to like brace all, it would hit me all of a sudden, you know, or there's like, I'd see hor horrific videos. And then I'd see one that just, there was something in that child's eyes. And there was something about the way that there, that, 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 that grandmother was raging that hit me and I would have to brace myself, you know, and, and bawl and cry. And so if anyone has been doing embodiment work and particularly anyone aware of the reclamation of feminine spirituality in our times now, so harmonizing and balancing spirituality is aware that emotions are a portal of wisdom and truth and they are nothing to be afraid of. 
but they are incredibly overwhelming. And we are not meant to be experiencing them in a vacuum, alone, and in isolation. And that is a great pain that many carry because we live in a very um, like soul-sucked world. It will never be completely drained of soul, but it is very, very, very dry out there. And so many people experiencing this in isolated vacuums struggle and suffer. And so in those moments, one of the keys that I've learned is allow as much of it to flow as possible, give it as much space as I can, breathe deeply, root myself into the earth, and also to never, and this is a key passed on through all oppressed people, the most marginalized, who do not have the privilege to fall into despair. Despair is a weapon of the oppressor. So in that deep sadness, in that deep rage, the one condition is I refuse to fall prey to despair. And that allows there to be some container because then where does the energy have to go? There's only one way for it to go. <laughs> Let it change me in the way that I walk in the world, in the way that I speak in the world, in the, in the fears that I may have held you know, before. And, and that I'm no longer willing to uh, compromise around them because the stakes are so high. And it's, it's now in my face, literally. So we only, I think, have an excuse when, you know, it's not even really an excuse, but once you know, you cannot unknow, right? And so you have, you have only one choice or else your life is filled with this burden and this weight. But it's because you have all, the, the veil has already been taken off and there's only one way forward. And it's not the way that we've come. It's not the way that we've been, we've been going about it because one of the key elements that's keeping the world as we know it today going is the comfort, the illusory comfort of modernity. So... That means I can, I can, I don't have to feel cold. I get to turn my heater on in a house or I don't have to be hot. I have to have air conditioning. It also means I get to watch, you know, a movie that, that touches me in some way or that, that. So there's all of the millions of things. I get to go to this delicious restaurant and there's a million beautiful things about modernity that are worthy of us enjoying in moments. But also our attachments to those comforts have made us um, not exactly apathetic, but just chilling. They made us be chilling. When really statistics are raining down upon us, we do not have another generation to go like this. We do not. We need a sense of urgency. We need a fire under our butt. And I think whereas before I, I was, um, I was more accommodating and and I, I would say like the the kind of nest of the mother this i think that part of also what has helped with a volcano in me for for a few years now has been asking to to stop placating to start just keeping it real and raw and and really just like life teaches us because life is the greatest parent the greatest teacher of of all it rips sometimes our gra the ground from under us and, and like wallops us into our next evolution. And so lovingly like Rafiki to Simba and the Lion King, I think that we need a good wallop. And that is, that is what is, is happening in us. And I think that one of the things that particularly those comfortable in privilege, whether they have platforms or not platforms, but even more so with the, the, what is your responsibility with a platform? Um, what I think that is, is not, it's not so, it's a subtle truth, but, but it is truth. Everything that inside their soul I know is aching will come from caring for the other. You know, that, that, like, that is, that is everything that brought one to this path. It comes when in service to the, to the most oppressed in the world, you know? 
and and everything that follows that that ripple effect and that echo because you can't you can't just do it one you know once and then it's it's finished it's like once you have devoted yourself once you've opened your heart enough you you're in it for life you're an ally for life there's no other way of living and being mm. Mm. yeah yeah thank you thank you in this this question of of allyship um something that i've been been witnessing in myself and, and and trying to understand is when we look at the situation and, and obviously we're focusing this lens in here into the immediacy of what is, is happening in in Gaza and Palestine and and the again this a lot of people are saying this is like the litmus test for humanity it's like what are you going to do now when this is like it's in your face you cannot turn away or you can turn away but it's still going to be it, it's still close at hand at any moment and one of the one of the points i've been meeting and and trying to reconcile in myself as an ally is um holding the space and being willing to engage in conversation being willing to listen this is important that we listen and we explore other people's perceptions but there are a lot of um people who are choosing to stay out of it because they say you know this is again where we go with this we'll see but you know um palestine is a proxy for the islamic brotherhood that hamas is a is a proxy for um iranian um one of the words i heard was sort of like a large psyop of trying to trying to kind of rile up deep support from the west basically I want to bring this question to this space because it's one of the pieces of contention that I meet in my environment when I'm when I'm speaking to this issue and I want to know what your thoughts are. I want to be sensitive as well. One of the the sort of um throwbacks I get from people is we in the west don't understand the politics in that part of the world um that we are, you know, we're looking at it through a westernized lens and acknowledging that both of us are not from that part of the world or on the ground there but witnessing as allies what we are what we are privy to and does it really matter what's going on in the background yeah thank you so important such a good question um the first thing i am going to say is that the psyop that's really happening is that we are fighting people who are on the same team so whenever anyone starts doing that we've already lost the cause who wins again the oppressor yes the islamic brotherhood is a real thing the 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 um islamic republic the the iranian government everything that has been happening in the women life freedom movement it is real it is horrific and they have tentacles throughout the middle east and africa including my homeland somalia which i have watched deteriorate over the last 20 years post civil war post colonialism through the fundamentalist islamic view so that that there's a branch of the islamic republic called al shabab for example that took over somalia that took over the education system that has from a young age been impregnating children with a specific form of islamic um interpretation now again bringing us back into the feeling body if anyone brings that to try and get me to stop caring about the orphan child that i've seen today am i going to be fooled no why because the mind specifically people who are all tied up in their intellect to debate and to to do all of the the mental gymnastics that's happening now are disconnected from the feeling sensors of the body the heart and the gut and the heart and the gut tell tell me at least I'll say tell me there is enough freedom to free us all whether or not the entire population of palestine is in support 
of the Islamic regime, which they're not, but if they were, I would nonetheless be fighting for their right to exist and not be annihilated. And if anyone wants to say that all of this is about Hamas, all they have to do is look at the West Bank. Hamas does not exist in the West Bank. The end. All of these, all of these mental gymnastics, again, are just trying to divert the attention from what is underneath, which would be a, a, a recognition of guilt and shame of the horrors committed in the name of Israel or, or Zionism. And I do think that it's okay to have activists that are focusing on Sudan, Congo, Iran, Syria. I mean, it's okay that that some people have kind of like a vision and a focus there. But anyone who's really part of the liberation movement is not telling anyone else, hey, why do you care about that? Specifically, when we have um, one of the first moments, probably since you know, there was, there was, um, Occupy Wall Street that, that began to get some, some growth and some movement. But even since the civil rights movement, we have not had so much global attention on a key symbolic liberatory cause. So, you know, I'll give an example. There, there is a, um, well-known psychedelic author who wrote about, who is Jewish and his, his, his opinions, you know, with respect, have changed, actually. And I, I appreciate when somebody recognizes and acknowledges, I was, and, and he has an article about this that, that speaks about, I was so, uh, it, it was so difficult for me to let go of the dream of Israel. And so I could not fully face the realities of what this government is doing. And I'm, I am more willing to now, though I still have doubts because X, Y, and Z. Okay, so problematic parts, but at least there is some redemption work happening. So in one of his, his beginning articles, he said, if you care um, more about what is happening in Palestine than what is happening in Sudan, when more people have died in Sudan, it's because you're anti-Semitic and you should look at it. Obviously, it's a long article. I've paraphrased it, but that was its message without interpretation. That was what it said. I am an East African woman. Sudan is just next door. And I, I responded with respect. How dare you use our name to try and evade responsibility of what is being done in your name? Again, anyone who is intimate with liberation movement is not trying to take a, a, attention away from any of them, but sees the interlinked and an intersectional weaving between all of these causes. We could have a whole conversation about why the darker skinned relatives are even more dehumanized in the human psyche than our Palestinian relatives. But that's a whole separate conversation. But guess what? When we start healing the dehumanization in the Palestinian cause, we also began to heal everything below that and every other echo horizontally. So just the mere fact that people are beginning to get educated about what the media is using, the language they're using about Palestinians have been killed, I mean, have, have died versus Israelis have been murdered. And, you know, people are going back and rewriting the titles of many of, many of the New York Times. And, and I mean, Al Jazeera still is, is doing it its best, but most of the Western-based media is presenting this in subtle ways that impact the human um, uh, digestion of what they're seeing. So even the, and one of the biggest ones is I can't even believe it that that there's a famine in Palestine. A famine happens when the rains stop coming. This is forced starvation upon a people, you know? This is no famine. <laughs> and so all of, all of that to, to bring us back towards the Islamic Republic and, and, and you know, these tentacles that, are, that exist in the world. I think that we can lean into yes and both. But what happens when I get into a, like an egoic 
battle about my self-importance, about who I have been as an identity, I'm not actually aligning with the liberatory cause. I'm aligning with my ego. And so I, I have seen many people I admired and care for fall prey to this. And, you know, Ish, I will probably stumble along the way, and I have in the past. It is human, but we have to call each other out and in with as much grace and respect as possible, but we need to be called in. Again, it goes back to that we don't have time to placate anymore. And what I, what, I, what I really want to address in that is the last thing is about guilt and shame. There is within neo-spirituality a lot of um, like acknowledgement of the toxicity of shame in the body and the being. And I heard once... Um, Shanti Mai, a guru in, in Rishikesh speak. And she said, shame is good like any medicine in just the right dose. And so I would encourage us to allow shame to enter in just the right dose for us to change. And I don't believe even in just the simplicity of like personal relating in bludgeoning others because of something they have done wrong again and again and again and again and shaming them and shaming them and shaming them. However, if somebody continues to do the same thing and the same thing and the same thing, calling them out on that, calling for accountability is not shaming. It is asking each other to rise up and do better. And that is absolutely valid. And that is, in fact, I would say, what all of us could pray for is to have good enough friends, real and true friends that will do so with love, with grace, with care, with belief in you, no matter what. But let me hold a truthful and difficult mirror when I have to. Yeah. 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 And this is the piece of, 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 of counsel and community it is noticing, and, and I, I mean, I've sat with this piece of, we're witnessing one of the deepest polarizations that, I mean, we went through it during COVID, there was a lot of polarization happening there, different people on different, had different thoughts on various things, on different approaches, and now we're kind of in this like re new cycle of e extreme polarity, and my my embodied piece consistently has been how can I find my way back to an open heart even when I'm in disagreement with someone and try to find a way to have conversation here and try to have a you know have a way to call this out and listen and that is this piece I think of deeper maturity within our spiritual path is a willingness to listen and a willingness to to, to speak up and I'm curious, a lot of people I think are feeling like, oh, posting on social media doesn't do anything. I think we have become the new media, medium, literally, in allowing information to come out that wouldn't be coming through, through further. But for you as an activist, using these platforms, how, how much impact do you think this is making at a grassroots level? Yeah, that's a really good question. I first just want to clarify that I wouldn't classify myself as an activist because I am not directly involved in community organizing. And I have been, I have, you know, I've, I've, I've supported in the creation with Extinction Rebellion of protests through Europe um, and, you know, have, have some links in that, but I want to just give my respect to the people who dedicate their life without having any financial or glory, let's say, give back from that to community organizing, which is the most effective form of activism. Um, now, as a medium or a voice or um, an educator, I would say, that is a branch of activism, but not necessarily its core, um, I think that it's very valid perception that 
you know, have, are, are the conversations I'm having with my uncle that, you know, going to change anything? Um, are my posts really changing anything? And so what I, what I do want to lean into is that what allyship means is listening again to those at the center of the locus and the most marginalized community here, which is the Palestinians from within Gaza. What are they telling us? Please keep posting. It is helping. The only reason we are still here, those of us who are still here, is because you are posting. And so what we have to do is listen and notice that part of that is also, again, who wins? The oppressor. Because by me thinking what I'm doing and the only avenue sometimes some people have of influence is through social media. Is that that's what they have, you know, they may be living in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by whoever. And and they this is the, the manner that they have of speaking and hopefully impacting someone somewhere. And again, I deeply do believe that information is part of the issue here. Ignorance is part of the issue. And the greater what happens is that like through connecting in constellation consciousness, so not living in these singular free atom delusions, constellation consciousness magnifies and amplifies more than the sum of its parts. So if I add the sum of each of these, let's say like if there were a voltage of of light bulbs, the actual magic of coming together and supporting a mutual cause amplifies more than actually adding up the voltage of each light bulb. And so what I mean by that is that when we enter into the field from from our our abilities, whatever those abilities are, it could be painting through social media. It could be just forwarding information. That is also valid. Um, it could be speaking and explaining my own decolonial process. Like to look at even, for example, a lot of the people who we're seeing now as influencers were not influencers four months ago, or they were small time influencers, but they began to tell their journey or their perspectives and it impacted enough people that it's, the word spread. There is few things more powerful than social media right now, I would say, in the sense that, as, as you spoke, it is the media of our time. And we would not even, if you look at the distortion in, in the traditional media, we would not even really know what was going on in Palestine without social media. We would not have a fraction of an idea. We would not be as informed as we are without that. So that alone should teach us something about its impact. Now, I will say, I will say this. I think that what this issue is also showing us is that popular opinion is not really what matters right now. It helps, but it's not enough. Why? Because we have systems in place that are running the show with a completely different program and agenda than what the majority of humans actually feel in their being. And it's crazy that... I think something like 70% of U.S. Americans agree on this issue, and yet nothing in the policy has changed. Do you know how hard it is for 70% of U.S. Americans to agree on anything? <laughs> so that, I think, orients us back to the beginning of, of my response here, which is towards real activism, community organizing in order to bring down systems. Community organizing, just for anyone out there who doesn't know, it, it includes protests. But even more importantly than protests now, I would say is civil disobedience, like general strikes, like stopping the, the business as usual that society would want to continue forward. And so if we look at the success in South Africa, for example, one of the key elements of that was the boycott that happened internationally that made it no longer um, like economically viable or or worth it to continue apartheid. Now that's a sad reality because ideally we would want apartheid to end because the majority of white South Africans wake up in some way. But you know, inshallah that happens, but it might take time. And during that time, black lives should not be on the line. Right? So in the same way, that's what the ceasefire is about. It's like we can't, we're not waiting for the day Israelis and Zionists deprogram themselves from from what they have have been taught since school and culturally 
what we have to do is ally those who get it, including though the those who may have been Zionists in the past or who are of the Jewish uh, faith, but who are aware of what is being done, and ally together to to stop the dehumanization that allows Palestinian lives to be discarded, you know, as an as a necess as a necessity for whatever reason, right? And that that requires community organizing and radical civil disobedience. And I I at least still argue for nonviolent civil disobedience, which I think if we did in a well organized way would have great impacts. But it requires a lot of courage. It requires also again a reorientation of our priorities. So um, part of part of that just to explain, like Martin Luther King said. Um, those who love peace must organize as well as those who love war, right? If we want anything to change. We're going to have to start working nine to five, not to uphold the systems, but to find the ways that we can break and be like um, glitches in the matrix or, or, you know, impediments to the cog that keeps turning. And in that organizing includes many, all of the tools that, that, Anyone has a role that they can offer to that, right? Not all of us have to be speakers. Not, and some of us can also work on, for example, in a general strike, you need people who are bringing in funds for those who are single moms or single dads, who are from marginalized communities, who have no money, who can't just leave a job because they would literally, everything would crumble on them. So to really do a general strike, you need to have behind the scenes work to uphold um, the the resistance enough time that it actually creates a shake in the field of the comfort and the inertia of how things have been, which is what 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 the let's say leaders and society um, of of the West in particular, but with its tentacles out everywhere, want is for things to just go back to business as usual, and we have to not let them. Yeah, yeah. So this this piece here around you know the resistance like really forging and feeling what that means and the truth is it requires us to bring us to witness at the very least to at least begin to witness and through the witnessing the organic process will maybe gravitate us towards community towards cohesion towards action but it begins here it begins with the witnessing yeah and actually a friend of mine from south africa um shivani mentioned this like um play on words where witness he now calls withness which i love because when i think of the word witness even the way it's been taught in meditation it's like you create a distance between you and the thing and rather, withness means I am with you. It's like I am holding your hand through the suffering and through the struggle, and I know we're going to make our way out of this. Yeah. There's one thing I want to, I'd, I'd really like to hear you speak a little bit on um, before we begin to, to anchor down. And this is around this, this, this saying, I can't remember who it's by, but it's, we cannot dismantle the master's house with master's tools. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big one. I think that this is one of the the aspects. So and and I think it's Audrey Lord and it was um like the anniversary of her maybe yesterday even. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So one of the masters let's say paradigm so if we look at decolonization first we have to like study the cages that we've been in and that would be what i call colonizer mind so one thing from within colonizer mind is that it, i think we don't allow enough space because of productivity and hustle and and go 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 we don't allow enough space for answers to arise from a maturity from a ripening and so in a way, it's not that I have a clear answer for the new tools that are needed, but we've touched on a few of them on, a, on, a, you know, on some of the key ones, like the 
ability to expand the sense of self from beyond the self and to hold equal love and proportion for the other as oneself rather than always in this, um, I would say maybe even a pendulum swing going from one extreme to another. But what I actually want to encourage is that as we attune to our emotional body, as we attune to the deeper intelligences within us, that ripening naturally happens from there. And so that is where I feel the tools of liberation that she's referring to will come from. And they won't come from the same place as the dominant culture. So what we what is required is a spaciousness from within our body and our being that is not trying to evade, that is not hiding, which is what I think the, let's say the misinterpretation within neo-spirituality has been, has been that in order for me to come from a different consciousness, I have to completely amputate from society. Rather than society or dominant culture is the compost. That's what I think is missing here. It's not like a purification culture that we need. What we need is a composting and we have to get curious in order to compost. So I have to look at supremacy in myself. And I can share a personal story around that, right? So like, I would say that though personally I've been in decolonization as a, as a field my entire life, um, but professionally, I would say maybe five or six years ago, I began to really deeply lean into it and bring it into my offerings. And there was a, an amputation in some form. So I went from incredibly politically active throughout uh, university, and then I went into a complete spiritual um, portal that was devoid of, of political context. So when these began to uh, unite in me, one of the ways that I had to deconstruct supremacy and the seduction of supremacy is around the feminine and the masculine. And by learning this, it has allowed me to now walk it and share it in all fields, not just these two dualities, but it's good to use as a case study. So a lot of feminists fall in this trap. <laughs> A lot of goddess spirituality falls in this trap because we have been so um, hungry for the feminine wisdom teachings because it has, it had, there has been a drought for a very long time. Then it, when we begin to get to know the feminine, it's like, oh my God, what was all that stupid masculine nonsense we've been doing? The linear, the logic, the intellect, all of that becomes lesser. And that may be an important part of the journey in terms of the balancing, let's say, of the extremes that we've been in. It may be that it was necessary, but to me, the maturity has come. And I also gave birth to a son, which was a deep initiation to understand this. Um, and when I was pregnant, actually, with my son, I wrote a, a, a mentor of mine and a teacher of goddess spirituality, which now, for example, is not showing up for a pro-Palestine, and this will show you why. And um, she said, yes, of course, the feminine is superior. And really, what, what better can you do to teach your son than to be in service to the feminine as, you know, as a higher, as a higher manifestation? And, you know, that moment I was like, something doesn't feel right here. Just doesn't. I, I, a part of me wants to be there with you in that because it feels like, oh yeah, you know, like us with our juiciness and our softness. And of course they wanted to oppress us because look at how radiant we are. Of course, all of that is true. However, now in my maturity and having gone too, too far in moments in the other side of the spectrum, my God, the beauty of the masculine, my God, structure, linearity, solidity, like con conscious awareness and presence, life would not exist without it either. Life literally cannot come without one and the other. There is no superiority and there is no inferiority. And the same, even within my, my uh, community that I grew up in, within African-American like struggles and liberation efforts, um, you know, this one is, is delicate because I don't believe in talking to other people about a liberation struggle that I am not directly affected by. So though I come from an African diaspora, right, from East Africa, it is a very different thing to have been enslaved and completely broken from your the lineage of your land. 
So I'm going to say this with caution and respect towards that. But what I witness and continue to feel inside of me is that it is not that white people oppress black people because they're better. It's that perhaps black people have a, 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 a remembering of part of what is indigenous earth centered culture that we might need to support our brethren and relatives that, that have less you know, of that in their, in their awareness culturally through many generations now. But it is not because of an inherent better or worse or less than. It's that sometimes we forget, others remember, and we support as a collective ecosystem so that indigeneity doesn't become something that is separate from being white, but that it may need to be a relearning, if it ever was, which I don't know. I don't know enough of the, the truth within history or not, but I know that there is beauty in the animistic cultures even from within the heart of what is you know the colonial empire of europe and a lot of people with white skin experience the oppression of that so who knows the illness may have just touched white people first and it could have gotten any of us at any time we have different responsibilities depending on our composition so my responsibility is not the same as my white sisters or brothers but it is my responsibility to not fall play, prey to the seduction of supremacy because of what may still be alive in me, what I may have been able to resource from my own culture that they have not. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. I am, I am deeply grateful for the space with you today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Such juicy, well-directed questions. I deeply appreciate you and recognize you in the field, you know, since we did a panel way back when on decolonization, um, just as a as a as an ally, you know, for for change in the world, for benevolent change, and and really willing to listen and lean in and get curious. And that's also why I think you ask such good questions. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there's the there's the thing like allow our curiosity to just guide us and don't be afraid to ask questions because that's where we can learn and we can we can have deep realization. So this is it. This is the spaces. Have more conversations, diverse conversations, maybe somewhat um, conflictual conversations but it's it's okay you know it's okay we can we can bring the space the space is being held there is enough of us holding the space to really want to go deeper in and and just witness the the ecosystem evolve so thank you so much Evian. of course thank you, thank you.